Hi, this is John Jackson Miller, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast, the show where Commander Riker went to learn how to get a leg up on the competition. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 131. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins the other red shirts aboard the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 in their mission to boldly go, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope. Because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his dry cleaning. All right, guys, our guest today is a New York Times bestselling author uh, of books in both the Star Wars and Star Trek universe. He's also written for Halo and a few other universes. Uh, but his latest offering, which you will be able to pick up on February 21st, is this beautiful book right here entitled Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The High Country. You see, he's holding up a copy of it, too. Uh, so we <laughs> are very excited. Fancy books. Yeah, our fancy schmancy hardcover cool books that got sent to us. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> we are very excited and very happy to welcome John Jackson Miller to the FSF podcast. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. Uh, so first off, again, thank you for sending me the book. Uh, I have, Like we were talking about in pre-show, I've had an opportunity to read a little bit of it to, get, to kind of get into the book, kind of get a feel for it. Um, and without giving away any details, I want to say one thing for me, uh, we are talking about how sometimes I'm a little bit of a slow reader. I do like audiobooks, I prefer those, but I do like how you jumped right in with characters that we know and that we love and mm -hmm. it grabs the attention right away. Uh, I thought you did a really good job of starting to build in the other characters in some of the supplemental chapters right after that. So it was, it was great action right into the story. Uh, and I, I was like, wow, we're jumping right into this. Okay. I felt like I was right in the middle of an episode as soon as we got into the book. And I was like, well, this is a really cool introduction into the book. So here's what I'm, I'm hoping you'll do uh, within the details that you feel comfortable sharing. Tell everybody about the book and where the idea for the high country came from. Okay, well, uh, the Strange New Worlds uh, franchise was uh, not on the air yet when uh, I was asked to write the novel for it uh, by uh, Kirsten Beyer, who is the uh, executive producer, one of the executive producers of the show. And I have worked with uh, Kirsten, uh, as well have the other people who have done streaming series novels, um, uh, because Kirsten is, she's in the writer's room on Discovery, she's the co-creator of Picard, uh, and then, of course, Strange New Worlds. And so just about every one of our books starts with a discussion with her. Uh, and uh, in, in this case, it was something where, um, you know, it was you know, something where it was wide open in terms of what I could write about. I, I uh, you know, sometimes have uh, a blank that I've got to fill in. So, uh, you know, the Enterprise War novel is where the Enterprise was during season one of Discovery. Uh, the Die Standing novel is where uh, Giorgio was, the emperor, uh, in between season one and season two, you know, her first mission for Section 31. Uh, you know, my, uh, my uh, Picard Rogue Elements novel, that is, uh, you know, the origin story of Captain Rios, more or less. Uh, but this was something where it was like, okay, well, um, a mission for the Enterprise. Uh, and uh, I kind of knew where it could be set. Uh, and so I really spent uh, a few weeks uh, just thinking about uh, what was going on in my life. Uh, and at the time, what was going on in my life is my house had been lifted off the ground physically. Uh, I, I, live in a, I live in an 1853 farmhouse uh, in Wisconsin. And uh, just uh, in between when I got the offer to write the, the book and when I had to start doing anything in terms of thinking about it, uh, the basement wall caved in, and so we had to get uh, a team to come out and actually physically lift the house, and uh, I had to decamp out of the house with my family during that time, and it got me thinking a lot about, uh, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of stories in Star Trek about, uh, about uh, you know, people being out of place, uh, being trapped yeah. away from all the things that they need to be able to use, uh, and uh, in, in particular, um, the uh, Enterprise crew, or at least several members of it, uh, become trapped on a planet, uh, a, very, a single, very strange new world, uh, where uh, technology does not work. Uh, and by technology, not even you know working. I don't just mean you know their modern you know twenty third century stuff. I mean you can't get a light bulb to work on this planet, and uh, you know that really sort of. 
uh, you know, create a situation where I, I, once I knew kind of what I wanted to do, and I knew that I had to keep enterprise, uh, you know, out of the picture, but still able to monitor what was going on, uh, you know, everything goes from there. So uh, we do have a situation we're on this planet. Uh, you know, it is, it is, uh, you know, one world, but many different facets to it. And uh, our characters are separated. They are having to uh, they're going on journeys both to try to find one another, find a way off of this planet, and figure out what's going on on this place because there's a, a series of mysteries uh, uh, that uh, that we're going to confront. And uh, along the way, uh, we also get to confront some uh, serious issues uh, with regard to the Prime Directive. Uh, the Prime Directive is brand new as of the Strange New World show. Up until now, it has been called uh, General Order Number 1. Right. And they're really just sort of feeling their way through. Uh, you, all of these things are sort of the, you know, the first encounters with this kind of a problem. Uh, and so this novel, uh, and if you're 10 chapters in, you haven't figured out all the secrets of it yet, I'll tell you <laughs> that. Uh, this 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 novel uh, brings up a particular kind of Star Trek story. Uh, and uh, what I like to do with these, with uh, with with my novels, where I tie in in any way or shape or form to an episode, I like to take it the next step and say, okay, yeah, well, what next? Um, you know, Die Standing uh, shows what happened to the Ioceans. Those are the mobsters from the uh, you know the Untouchables planet from uh, right. uh, the original series. Um, it shows what happened to them a hundred years later. Um, hmm. I have other uh, stories, uh, you know, the Die Standing novel uh, gets into, uh, you remember that gaseous cloud that uh, was driving Kirk crazy in the uh, in the episode Obsession? Well, what was that really all about? Uh, you know, do clouds just do things? Well, that's in there, uh, and and I follow along. Even my very first story for um, for Star Trek, which was a uh, an a um, an e novella that I did uh, called Absent Enemies uh, that looked at that episode uh, of the Next Generation called the Next Phase, uh, where Jordy and Roe were trapped in between phases and uh, able to walk through walls and things. But why didn't they fall out of the back of the ship? Uh, why did that <laughs> Romulan who was between phases uh, actually look like he was sitting down in a chair at one point. How did that happen? Well, I I took that as a challenge, and that was uh, that was part of that <laughs> that was part of that story. And then what I do is I work it into whatever the larger issues that I want to explore are. And so um, you know, this I really wanted this to be um, you know a, an epic, um, you know, something that uh, was it, it is the longest book I've written for Star Trek or really for anything. Uh, it it is. Um, you know the you know Gene Roddenberry pitched this uh, this series as Wagon Train to the Stars, and that that referred to the the TV show Wagon Train that was on, which was you mm -hmm. know going across across a wide expanse and you know running into adventures one after the other. Well, I kind of do that, and one of the really cool things we were able to do is uh, we had just announced this novel uh, at Star Trek Mission Chicago last year in April. Uh, we got the cover, you know, the same day. We we you know, starting to promote it. The very next week, I am at I think it was called Fan X uh, Indianapolis or Fan Expo Indianapolis. Uh, there's like the, there's nine conventions with Fan and X in their name. I'm not sure. What they are. <laughs> it's so confusing. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm there on the floor. I've had a really great day because I I've just met. Jamie Farr and Loretta Swit from uh, from Mash, and so for an old TV uh, fan like me, it's 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 uh, it was really great. And then I hear that because of the supply chain problems, all the books have been pushed three months ahead. Mm -hmm. And so this novel ended up being, uh, you know, it, it was going to be a Thanksgiving, you know, pre Christmas release. To now we're in February, and oh boy, yeah. Which is not the best time to you know release a book unless you want no competition, which is just as you know, just as good. So there's 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 positives, I suppose. And I said, okay, here's what I'd like to do. Um, I didn't think we were going to have time to do it um, in the previous thing, uh, but I said, okay, I've got all these maps that I've been working with, showing what the planet looks like and where everybody is and everything. 
um, can we do the maps in the book? And uh, it, it turned out, yeah, uh, everybody was on board. And so um, there are several maps in this novel. Um, you really shouldn't skip ahead to them before you actually get to those, those parts. But the, well, now the, you tell me. Yeah, now I tell you. Well, I know people can't <laughs> avoid it. People can't avoid it. But but the, the 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 purpose of the maps is you know so that you can kind of follow along as you get there. Uh, and the maps are not, um, as you will have seen, the maps are not uh, sort of the enterprise's view of things. They're not, uh, you know, these are not satellite maps. These are not, uh, you know, this is not one of those things where there's an LCARS display and, you know, things all around it. And it looks very Star Trek-y. Um, no, these are the maps from the point of view of the natives, the people who live on the planet, uh, various different styles they're in. Uh, and uh, and so we were able to actually do quite a few uh, you know, more. Um, when I did my book, Lost Tribe of the Sith for Star Wars, we only had two maps in there. And it still made it a beloved kind of a thing because, yeah, you know, who doesn't like a map in a book? Uh, so uh, it turns out this was uh, this is the first Star Trek novel since 2000 that has uh, has maps in it. Uh, and uh, that was uh, that was a stitch in time. Those were maps of the capital city of Cardassia. Well, these are here. Here we got some more. So, uh, you know, this is a cool thing. And the other cool thing about it is, if you're into audiobooks, uh, as I understand it, if you buy the audiobook, you also get the maps in, oh, a, wow. in, a, okay. in a PDF supplement. And that idea, the whole the whole reason that they're going to be available is because um, I did a I did a a show. I do an, I do a show every year for Wisconsin Public Radio in December. And we decided this year that we would book um, Robert Patkoff, who does uh, the you know, he reads Strange New Worlds, and also he's read uh, Enterprise War and uh, uh, the uh, the Rogue Elements novel of mine. Uh, and we also booked January Lavoy, and she is the reader for um, the Die Standing novel. Uh, and so we do a, we did a great hour that's on there. Go to wpr.org, search my name, and you can find the hour. Uh, and uh, an hour on what it, you know what's involved in doing a pod not a podcast but doing an audiobook for Star Trek and we got to the end of it at, and off air I said well I know you're in studio working on this novel right now uh Robert I, I just wish that people would be able to get the maps and they both said you can they actually have a, a thing where you know if you buy the audiobook uh you, there are supplemental PDFs that are available sometimes That's and cool. so uh, as far as I know um we're gonna have that. So <laughs> really cool. hopefully people can look for that. But uh, but yeah, and then that, as you said, it, uh, it, that's uh, that's that novel's coming out February 21st, audiobook, ebook, and uh, hardcover. Awesome. Excellent. I want to say one thing before anybody else jumps in with any other questions. One of, the, and this is not a spoiler by any means, but so uh, two things I found interesting about the, 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 the few chapters I've had a chance to read. Number one, I love the fact that, so, I was never a big fan of Star Wars or Star Trek, rather, uh, up until Strange New Worlds. Strange New Worlds mm -hmm. is what kind of got me into Star Trek, and I've been watching it since. Um, and I'm I'm in like season one of of uh, Next Generation right now. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did, so I tell you that because two reasons. Number one, I thought it was interesting how, as I'm watch, as I'm reading through the book, and I'm hearing your, I'm, I'm reading the dialogue from different characters. I'm honestly hearing it in their voice. Um, you know, like, uh, especially with Una Chin Riley and some of the the dialogue that she has with 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 some of the people on the planet. <laughs> so just some of the comments she made, I was like, I could hear Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Romaine say those things, you know, just it was just very cool. And then the other thing is it, some of it made me laugh. And it's mainly because you there was a couple references to the prime directive and some of the things that were happening because of the prime directive. And we literally on our live show just this past Monday talked about the prime directive because I was so blasted, confused coming in from a Star Wars universe, <laughs> trying to figure out what in the heck the prime directive was and how it affected things. And so, yeah, it, it was just kind kind of funny that it was the the timing of everything and like, yeah, I'm reading sitting here reading a book going and all of a sudden we're talking about the prime directive I'm like huh, well hey three nights ago I might not have understood this so well that that was on purpose your colleagues contacted me in the middle of last year and said uh, hey in February we're gonna 
to have this conversation. Um, no, that that's yeah. You know, look, every novel is somebody's first. Every um, you know, every episode of a show is somebody's first. And yeah, they're not great episodes to come in on if if you don't know what is going on. And same for books. You wouldn't, you know, I did a trilogy called Prey, and you wouldn't have wanted to come in on book three of that uh, for the that Star Trek trilogy I did. Uh, but uh, but you know, hopefully we give everybody what they need to you know, hit, kind of hit the ground running. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a, a focus here uh, on you know, a core group of characters that should be familiar to people. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I do is, um, you know, there's a, this is, as I say, it's a big sprawling adventure of a book. Uh, and I uh, alternate between chapters where, you know, it's it's Christopher Pike. Uh, the hero, and then we uh, we go out to to uh, to see everybody else, or not not everybody, but most of the other characters, uh, and and uh, you know some of the locals on the planet as well. They have their their sequences in there, um, and then I try to get right back to it and keep it kinetic and keep it going. Um, that's one of the things that came up in the in the interview about uh, that we did about audiobooks as well. Is the audiobooks have really changed the way that I write. Um, when I started out, I would have been writing, uh, you know, for Star Wars novels, uh, you know, it would have been normal for a chapter to be, you know, two, three, four thousand words. Uh, and uh, what's happened is in the interim, uh, the Kindle has come along, which is actually telling us how much people read and how long they read and for what snippets of time they read. And then in particular, Audible um, with audiobooks uh, is actually saying to us, hey, uh, here's how long people tend to listen when they turn the app on. Uh, and, uh, you know, what you find is that because people are commuting, because people are in their cars or their whatever kind of situations, uh, they tend to dip in and out of stories about as often as people stop to watch a commercial on TV. Uh, <laughs> or not that they want to stop to watch a commercial, but, you know, the you'll notice that even... In the streaming series, even in uh, Strange New Worlds, when it airs on TV, uh, it, it, you know, on Paramount Plus, uh, they still have sort of act breaks uh, that are, you know, six minutes, seven minutes sure. or something in there, in part because they know that it's also going to air on Pluto or it might air on one of the, the other you know, CBS affiliated channels. But it's also the case that people tend to digest entertainment in chunks. <laughs> and so um, it's become much more the case that, you know, I think I've got 79 chapters in this book and they're about 1500 words each uh, or somewhere along that line. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 I think it has an impact on, um, you know, the, the, the action in the story because it's changed. Things are changing a lot faster because, you have um, that many more uh, opportunities for cliffhangers, mm -hmm. uh, that many more surprises, that many more big reveals. Um, and that's kind of something that, you know, I started in as a comics writer. Um, you know, I was accustomed to do, doing that anyway. Every page you flip is a reveal, is an opportunity for a new character to appear, for sure. an explosion. So, mm -hmm. uh you know, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of, you know, imported that into uh, into the the novel writing. Perfect. That actually makes a lot of sense. And I was going to actually ask about your comics because in doing research, it said that you were Wikipedia, which we know is not the most accurate thing in the world, said that you were a publisher of mini comics, and your own website says that you wrote for a small press comic series, Far Away Looks. Yeah. So, what are mini comics? Why don't okay. we see more of them these days? And can any of those originals still be found? Okay. Uh, wow. If they can be found, I'd be surprised. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the uh, the small press uh, movement, uh, you know, the uh, fanzines uh, start in comics uh, in 1960. Uh, the um, one of the two uh, first fanzines that ever came out uh, was uh, was a a you know newsletter by my friend Maggie Thompson. Uh, her and her husband Don, uh, and uh, wow. there, uh, you know, that evolved into uh, yes, there were fanzines talking about Star Wars and Star Trek and comics and that sort of thing, but there were also comics, uh, you know, art, uh, you know, you know, newsletters that would be out where people would have their own stories, 
uh, they actually had amateur press associations where they would everybody would bundle all their comics together, put them in a single book called an apazine, and then they would photocopy it and mail it around to everybody. That was in the 70s, and and that's kind of going away in the 80s. By the 80s, uh, pretty much everybody's got their own photocopier. Uh, and uh, and when my dad got his uh, copy machine and I started using it, um, through the pages of Maggie's magazine called Comics Buyer's Guide, uh, I connected with other people who were publishing, drawing their own comics and publishing and sending them out back and forth. And, you know, no money was changing hands, but there are a lot of people that came uh, into the, the comic scene in the 90s and 2000s that, you know, that was their amateur hour, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that was what they did. And so um, in my case, uh, you know, I can't draw. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a good artist. <laughs> um, but it did teach me something about how, uh, you know, how, you know, when I'm writing a script, what can fit into a panel? and what the tempo should be and and how many words should be there. So it, it allowed me to get into solidarity with the artist somewhat. Now, the reason you don't see those these around so much anymore is because um, technology, again, um, these became the web comics, mm -hmm. uh, the same okay. way that uh, fanzines gave way to blogs uh, oh, or, sure. yeah. or just regular sites. Uh, so, so again, um, you know, if I had... Grown up 30 years later, I would almost certainly have, uh, you know, had a, a webcomic. I did have a webcomic at one point. It it, uh, it didn't it didn't do very well, uh, but we, we did it for a couple of years. Uh, but uh, again, it was just something where, uh, you know, it was a training ground uh, for a lot of folks. And it was just a fun hobby thing. Cool. Interesting. So one of the things, um, you are a storyteller, and we love hearing the stories of how different people came to be or how things or originated and you being the hero of our story what is your origin story what was oh, it that got that got you into writing and like how did you get to where you are today well i can actually now say this because before i had written this book i had no reason to bring this in but I was born the night the piece of the action episode first aired. That was the <laughs> one that has the uh, the mobsters uh, and uses all this all the uh, uh, in Star Trek where they where they uh, you know used all the sets from uh, the Untouchables mm -hmm. uh, because it was the same studio. Um, cool. But it was some time after that before I actually uh, I, I I started reading comics uh, age six. I started drawing my own comics at the same time. Uh, and uh, typing out my own stories on uh, our Smith Corona typewriter. Uh, my mother was a grade school librarian, so you know she encouraged me to keep all my comics and put them in order and hang on to them. Um, you know, Star Wars comes along 1977. I think I'm nine years old at that point. Uh, and my sister, uh, Kathy, um, uh, you know, one of the cool things about an older sibling who's into pop culture uh, is you know, she had introduced me to you know, Monty Python and George Carlin and mm -hmm. just about everything else that was nice. out there. And, um, you know, she made a, a mission in her life to get me in to see Star Wars, which was difficult because Star Wars at the time, you know, we were not in the multiplex era yet. Uh, you know, getting in, you know, you know, on Saturday afternoons when a kid can go to a movie is not always so easy. Uh, and so I did uh, dedicate uh, the novel Kenobi when I did uh, put that out uh, in 2013 uh, to my sister Kathy for making sure she that her kid brother got in to see the movie. That's 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 the line that's in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so yeah, it, it sort of goes from there. Uh, obviously, I'm a big Star Wars uh, fan of the comics. And I've got the trading cards, and Kathy's mm -hmm. helped me get all the action figures and everything. Um, Star Trek comes on a little bit later. Um, even though I'm aware of the series uh, and I've seen some episodes, uh, you know, it was in syndication then. So the episodes would air randomly. And, um, you know, that's a that's a thing that people today in the streaming era don't understand. Right. Which is, which is that these things were never intended to be watched in any order. And, uh, you know, so it always is the case that, uh, you know, that people 
will uh, you know start a series saying, well, when is this going to get good? And if you say, you know, season two, they're like, what? Uh, they, they don't understand. They don't understand why it, uh, you know why you have to wait that long. Mm-hmm. Or season three in some series cases, uh, or season four. Um, but uh, but that is how it works. Um, so yeah, uh, I um, yeah continued doing uh, as as mentioned. Um, you know, my own fanzines and, and comics became a you know big collector of comics. Uh, my uh, you know I got a journalism degree. Uh, was the editor of my campus paper at Tennessee. Um, took a left turn into. Um, I got pretty much the last Soviet studies degree that was offered in this country, the last master's degree in it. <laughs> uh, because, well, the, uh, I, and I've told this joke over a hundred times. So anyone who's heard it, I apologize, but uh, I would have gone for my doctorate, but the Soviet Union collapsed on my dissertation. Um, I was, <laughs> oof. <laughs> I was literally driving back from Indiana University where I had, uh, I had taken the summer program for uh, learning Russian. Uh, and before I got back to college, the coup had happened in uh, in the Soviet Union. And uh, by the end of the next week, everything that I was planning on studying was gone. Oh. And and so I said, you know what? I'm going to just uh, I'm, I'm going to take the master's and I'm going to go get a job. Uh, the job ended up being uh, editing a line of trade magazines for the lumber business. And I've said this line before too, but I don't know, you know, I don't know what you know about the lumber business, but it's not anywhere near as glamorous as all that. It's uh, not no. or, or or interesting. Uh, and I I I struggled with that long enough to get a copy of Comics Buyer's Guide. Again, that paper that I had subscribed to for years that was run by Don and Maggie Thompson, saw an ad in the back of it where they were hiring for. Uh, an editor for the sister publication of Comics Buyer's Guide. This is Comics Retailer, the trade magazine for the comics industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was hired as the editor for that. I moved up here to Wisconsin 30 years ago from Tennessee. um, And I arrived just in time for the comics industry to collapse. So (laughs) this is, this is once again, me and me and my luck. I, 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 you know, once you've knocked down the Soviet Union, I, I guess, uh, you know, just a, <laughs> you can apparently do anything. <laughs> yeah, publishing business. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I I spent the next seven years walking, you know, the 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 comics market uh, through, uh, you know, this uh, this this terrible uh, collapse that we were in. And, you know, things start to improve in the early 2000s uh, and rebound, you know, after that. Uh, and it is in that stretch uh, in 2003 uh, that I got the gig to write my first uh, comic series, and that was uh, Crimson Dynamo at Marvel. Uh, and uh, if, you cool. see, if you're seeing a pattern there, it's because Crimson Dynamo is the Russian Iron Man. And so mm-hmm. I wrote a series that updated um, with Crimson Dynamo uh, for the uh, post-Cold War period. And... That led to a year on Iron Man, which led to me getting uh, to write Star Wars comics. Uh, and, you know, once Knights of the Old Republic is going and it goes for like five years, you know, that gets the novels into the picture. And yeah. uh, and then, then Star Trek and every other door starts to open then. Because really, as I've said before, it's about getting your passport stamped. Once they know that you can you know, write about a certain group of characters or, or, or write in a certain universe uh, and not mess everything up uh, right. and, and that you can hit your deadlines. Um, you know, that, that tends to uh, lead to uh, job offers. There you go. I do love that it was your sister that got you into Star Wars though. Cause I feel like that with my brothers, my brothers are 10 and 12 years older than me. So, yeah, I mean, my intro to star wars i don't remember watching the original trilogy because it it was just part of our life yeah but when phantom menace came out and they're like hey we're gonna go see this new star wars movie you want to come with us and i'm like yeah of course i want to come see it with you i love that that's like (laughs) the older siblings are like hey we're gonna we're gonna raise and nurture this little nerd and (laughs) it's worked it's worked out for me that's exactly that's exactly what I did, and you know I, I've been I've been mentioning Kathy in all these broadcasts. Uh, uh, she's had some yeah, health uh, challenges here lately, but uh, okay. you know, I'm 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 trying to I'm trying to get her as many of the podcast links as I can, and uh, yeah. it's there you it's go. Uh, and now it is 
everything about um you know uh, uh, i think the the way that things worked out for me does harken back to something back in the day um you know the uh the the fact that when i was uh you know 14 and got to high school the fact that everybody else who had been into comics or uh role playing games or video games or anything cool suddenly decided oh well we're now into you know dating and 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 <laughs> and drinking and other things and we don't need any of that stuff anymore john do you want our stuff sure um, yeah and so you know i wasn't you know interested in anything else anyway at that point and i'm like okay i'll take all your stuff and that was when i started subscribing to comics buyer's guide and really sort of wallowing in the history and mm -hmm. it's like you know i'm i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to do this so i i think that uh, uh, uh to a great degree um you know the fact that i just happened to be there when that wheel stopped um and some of those people later on oh all of those people later on said hey i wish i had that stuff back and it's like mm -hmm. hey, I, 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 i'm sure you do uh, <laughs> Sorry about your bad luck. It's in my collection. It sucks to be you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so there's that, and uh, and I will say that, um, and this was really cool because related specifically to Strange New Worlds, uh, this is another case of that where uh, Strange New Worlds, um, and I and I announced this uh, on Saturday uh, after sending them copies of the book. I I um, I dedicated it to three of my teachers from junior high and high school. Uh, who had had a major impact on, um, you know, what I did. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of them, uh, uh, you know, Bernsey is what we called her, uh, was a was a former nun from New York City, uh, living in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, oh so so the so the accent is already there. But also, she was, uh, you know, a, you know a hippie flower child sort of a person at that point, and so she was. She was always interested in introducing us to things like she she we 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 first saw MTV because she brought a big TV set and a videotape uh, in. Uh, oh, cool. She was she thought it was she thought it was visual poetry. Uh, you know she was into comics. She was into uh, Bradbury. Uh, she mm -hmm. would assign okay. us these things. Uh, uh, she let me turn in my stories in or my my stories, but my my essays in comics form. Um, just That's wonderful. Awesome. And and she passed away a few years ago, uh, but not before she knew that I was in this business. And That's I cool. actually I actually uh, you know, when I went to San Diego Comic Con for the first time, she had already moved out to California to uh to teach uh English as a second language. Oh. Uh and, and I I uh, I you know, she was one of the first people I saw. And so yeah. uh so I, I dedicated the novel in part to her because I said you know, because she was into all of these things, and there would be she would consider no memorial cooler than getting mentioned in a Star Trek novel. That's um, awesome. And then I, I had two other uh, teachers who are, are are still with us, and I sent them copies of the book, and they both sent back uh, uh, selfies, and uh, you know, uh, they've they got tagged in uh, in you know all, all the Facebook posts this weekend, and so um, you know they're they're since retired, but but you know, uh, hey, look, everything is is is. I think you know, one of the things, one of the reasons that on my website, I, I on my about page, it says that I strip mine my childhood for a living. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, you know, I had a, I had what I would say is a pretty decent childhood. Certainly, I would call it a privileged childhood. But you know, with the fact that I had a house with books in it, I had a, you know, my my because of my mother. You know, I had um, you know the pop cultural influence with my sister, um, my dad, uh, who is you know just like my son, uh, it, it, you know, is not into reading, but is into gadgets and technology, and and they're both into electronics, and so you know knowledge was in the house too. Uh, you know that you know the the you know the science part of things is in there, and so you know I I kind of look at that and I feel like okay I. I have an obligation since I had this head full of you know useless uh -huh. information to put it to use for folks. Um, and you know, I, I do hear from people saying, you know, the, these books have helped me get through times where things were not great. Right. That's very cool. All right. So we mentioned that you've 
and you've talked about it yourself that uh, you've written in a couple different sci-fi slash nerd universes, Star mm-hmm. Wars and Star Trek, uh, most predominantly. I'm curious though, when somebody has has written for both because they're they're clearly two d- vastly different universes and how they function and the rules and how they operate and all these different things. Do you find it personally easier to write for one of the universes instead of the other because of your own personal fandoms, or have you found a happy medium in between the two? Um, yeah, there have only been a few times where writing for both of them have overlapped. Um, you know, when I'm working on things, uh, I know 2018 was the wild one because that was the year where I had something that I was working on for not just Star Wars and Star Trek, but also Battlestar Galactica too. Uh, mm-hmm. It was because I. <laughs> Because I wrote the 40th anniversary graphic novel or comic series uh, for uh, for that, uh, which is a book called Counter Strike, which is uh, which is out there. Um, and you know, whatever it happens to be, I mean, the rules of each universe are different. Also, the themes of each series are different. Um, you know, sort of the vibe of how the characters interact are different. Um, you know, one of the dynamics of of, of Star Wars. Uh, at least at least the original movie, is that the characters don't want to be together. Uh, the characters are thrown together. They're thrown into an adventure that is not of their, not of their making. Uh, and uh, they're, they're very different from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas, um, you know, Star Trek has the different backgrounds thing, but everybody's there on purpose. Uh, everybody's right. there as part of a, you know, this, uh, this um, you know, at, at least it's organized in a military structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's actually a military or not is something that people debate. Um, I think they have a whole lot of it. Really, really powerful weapons could not be a military. Uh, but, I would but, agree. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that that actually is a theme. Uh, or one of the, that is one of the subplots in my Enterprise War novel. That is the that is the first novel that has the Anson Mount uh, mm-hmm. Captain Pike character on the book. Right. Uh, yeah, the, the one of the things about uh, Enterprise War is um, the Enterprise uh, is not able to participate in the Klingon War because they're stuck in a war of their own. They wander into somebody else's war where the fact that Enterprise has these colossal weapons uh, makes Enterprise both a prize and a battleground uh, for the other sides. So um, so that that does come up. Uh, but but I mean yeah the, the the themes are different uh and then of course the yeah you know, the mechanisms of writing in the universe are different um look the Star Trek you you've got the transporter the transporter is um you know something which was created as a cost cutting measure for the series but it is storytelling magic it allows you to go bang right to the uh mm-hmm. right to where it is you don't have to worry about what happens a lot in Star Wars which is how does this ship land? Um, how does the ship land? It's crashing. It's weird, it's weird looking. It's <laughs> <laughs> another it's, happy landing. Yeah. Well. I, well. I mean. I mean. You know. The. Uh, the. Uh, you know. The. The. The, 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 the giant ship that you see at the end of Empire Strikes Back. You know. How does right, that right. thing land? You know. Where's right. Where's the door? Uh, <laughs> you mm-hmm. get in and, and out. The fact well, that I, anybody. The fact that people in Star Wars seem to be able to fly their ships so well. It's yes. like, have you ever gotten in a rental car and not known how to use the headlights? Well, how do you just know how to fly this ship? Well, and everybody just knows everything just like that. And mm-hmm. um, and you, you know, even though I do have stories every so often where there are, you know, there can be technical difficulties. We see them in Empire Strikes Back where they can't right. get the Falcon to work. Um, but you can't ever science your way out of that difficulty. Um, right. You can't ever pseudoscience your way out of that difficulty. We never find out exactly, you know, reverse the power couplers or whatever. It's never more than gobbledygook. Mm-hmm. Where, whereas in Star Trek, um, yeah, you can actually come in there and 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 you know, Jordy LaForge will come in with a plan, and um, we'll talk about phase inverters and other things, and right. and it has to sort of sound, uh, you know, uh, you know, correct. So, um, so in um, it, it's interesting, um, you know, these for for two novels that were published ten years apart, um, that's the Kenobi novel and uh, and Strange New Worlds. Um, you know, the uh, the Kenobi novel has um, one advisor in common because I always try to get somebody who knows what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. It has one one advisor in common with uh, with this uh, with this novel. Um, it, it my my friend Beth Canan, who is um, you know, she's a, an equestrian expert, 
uh, uh, you know, she uh, she works with uh, you know bloodlines and all that sort mm-hmm. of thing that, that breeders are into. Uh, you know, she uh, helped me come up with what the saddles for the creatures in Tatooine would look like, the dewbacks. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and, okay. and because I didn't know the names for all the parts of it. And she's okay, well, this thing here would be here. This thing here would be here. This thing here would be here. And so I can whip that kind of detail onto things. And I, I sound a little better. Uh, right. But then, of course, she also is in this book as well, helping me. Because um, while this novel is not specifically a Western, it is a science fiction novel with horses in it. Uh, as my as my right. editor put it, so uh, so we got to deal with that. <laughs> now it just also happens that this novel also has uh, a a particle physicist from Fermi Lab who helped me out on a couple of the ideas, and uh, and then also uh, a planetary scientist uh, who uh, you know who uh, you know suggested some things about the planet, uh, and you know that is something where if you're doing um, uh, you know a Star Trek novel or something that's harder science fiction, yeah. Uh, it, it only, you know, the science only has to be good enough for Star Trek. Uh, nobody, nobody should actually, you know, try to patent my ideas or try to aviate right. using right. any of my information. Uh, but yeah, you know, people appreciate it if you make it sound like you tried. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah. along the same the same sort of lines, though, as Tim was talking about, and you've kind of touched on it a little bit anyway. So having these already set universes that then you're writing in. Does that help you with your creative process or does it kind of hinder it because you're already stuck in somebody else's world? I, I, I just, it's interesting to me to try to write yeah. in somebody else's already yeah. created universe. Um, the talk that I do at a very a variety of places uh, it, uh, on writing in a shared universe is called Rule the Galaxy Together. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, sort of the notion is you're trying to, um, you know, we're, we're all, I, I, I liken I liken these universes to um, national parks. We're trying to go there. We're trying to make use of all the things that are there, and then we're trying to leave the place the way it was when we found it. Um, okay. You know, we, we're trying not to make a mess. And good if analogy. you if you do add something, you know, it it better be good. Um, right. But your job is not to come in there and say, "Hey, uh, Lucasfilm, I have this really great idea." Luke and Leia, they're not twins, they're triplets. There's a third kid out there somewhere. And <laughs> I've created her. Uh no. Um, yeah, that's that's not uh that's not your role. Your role is to help them expand the brand uh and come up with something that's entertaining for mm-hmm. for the readers, uh in between the movies or the TV shows or the whatever else. Um, and uh, and so that's kind of what we do. Um, but you know, as far as actually you know navigating things, well. It all depends on whether the shows, the source material, are still going or not. Okay. So, f- for example, when I did okay. that Battlestar Galactica uh, 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 you know, thing, um, I think I got two notes from Universal. Because, again, the show uh, that I was basing it on was not the 2003 Galactica, but the 1978 Galactica. And so, you know, their their notes were just, you know, make sure that, you know, you can't, the show, the, the, the comic can't be dark. <clears throat> It okay. can't be. It can't be dark. The new series is dark. The old series has hope, uh, okay. and and Lord Green, uh, and uh, yeah, and then also they 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 suggested, you know, let's let's conf- you know let, let's uh, let's see if we can confront Adama with a problem of his own making, uh, you know, something that he's been pushed to do uh, as a as a course of, uh, you know, being in flight. And something where he could try to set it right, and you know that's that's great. That's the guidance that set me off to do the whole thing. Um, and uh, you know, whereas uh, if the show is um, going, if the show has a you know many many other people working on it, writing it, uh, you know, then it gets more complicated. You have to make sure you're not colliding with anything. Mm-hmm. What they do is they provide you the materials that you need. Um, I. I never get into, you know, what materials I have on anything I'm working for now. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, you know it, it should be fairly obvious that, you know, when I when I wrote the, um, you know, the, the, the New Dawn novel for Star Wars, um, which was the Rebel prequel. Well, mm-hmm. the novel came out a month before the TV show started. So <laughs> I, I had access to quite a lot of information. Plus, uh, plus, I, you know, I was uh, I was, uh, you know, the the 
the the outline uh you know, was was read and responded to by uh, Dave Filoni and the other two uh the oh, other cool. two the other two executive producers and then you know Filoni and uh, and I and the Lucasfilm story group were in a conference call discussing the the uh, the book and everything else and it, you know, it all began with uh, with the executive producer sort of saying well here's the kinds of stories or or, or the types of stories that you can tell and not collide with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what I do to make my life easier is I usually say I want as much room as possible. Uh, so I, on purpose, uh, with A New Dawn, said, all right, the earliest possible story that they have suggested to me is how Kanan and Hera, the main characters, met. <laughs> and that would have been five years before the TV show. And I said, that's cool. I'll do that because... That way, I don't have to worry about uh, you know the other characters who come along later and what I can and I can't say about them. Uh, cool. yeah. But what they what they said is okay. Well, you can do this. You can give us the meeting of these characters, and you know, here's how we think that that they will react to one another. Then, um, but you can talk about what's going on in Kanan's head, but you can't talk about what's going on in Hera's mind because Hera's history was going to be revealed in the first season. Mm. Uh, and so, again, that's fine. That's just part of, uh, you know, that's that's part of the the thing that I do. Um, you know, it's, you, you can almost look at it as as these are uh, prequel TV episodes or prequel or, or, or episodes that are going to go in the middle of the series, or you can imagine sure. it like that. We treat it like that's what it's going to be. And so we care about that amount of continuity. And then we care about continuity between book to book. And I also worry about books to comics and books to things that people don't care about. <laughs> um, uh, you know, because it, well, in Star Wars, everything since A New Dawn is now part of the in the canon. So you have to worry about all of it. Uh, Star sure. Trek, uh, you know, the source material is still the source material. It's still the TV shows and everything. The novels that are being written um, uh, like, uh, like we're doing, you know, I call them canon adjacent, which mm -hmm. is to say, you know, uh, sometimes we're actually able to do some cool things like, um, well, uh, Die Standing introduces a character that did not appear in Discovery until after the novel came out. Um, hmm. And it's because I knew that character was coming and they let me put that character in. Um, you know, that was that that's not something that that, you know, happened very often before that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I uh, I'm. I'm always uh, understanding that uh, writing in the shared universes, particularly when the series are going, uh, that's a moving target. Um, it's one reason why I shy away sometimes from writing for video games <laughs> because, uh, or, or writing for comics about video games because mm -hmm. the video games are always changing. Yeah. So we have a Facebook group and it has over 209,000, I think. Yes. And it is just filled with memes of this universe and that universe and various funny things. Uh, so if you could visit any universe, which universe would you like to vacation on? A vacation on? Well, it's uh, I, I, uh, I, well, well, Cloud City is nice, but I, I, I don't dig heights. So, uh, <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I did do a book uh, on on uh, the casino world from episode eight. Uh, Canto Bite was the name of that, um, and uh, and that was that. You know, there's no no heights there, uh, and that was a lot of fun because I I wrote entirely about it. it it's a novella that I wrote uh, about a gambler, uh, and uh, and so it that's one of the lightest novels or novellas that I've ever written. You know, it, there's the body count in it is zero. There's nothing really bad happening. Uh, it's just a very pleasant place. And I'm like, okay, I, I can live there. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, uh, Star Wars, it, it, it really depends on what part of the universe you're living in. Uh, right. But, uh, but <laughs> otherwise, uh, you know, I don't know. So many, so many franchises, uh, you know, there, there are dystopic elements to it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, Fair enough. and the play, and the places where I think I would be able to function best are not places that you would actually want to live. Um, you know, I, I, my, my favorite TV uh, universe, I guess if you want to set aside Star Trek, was the Max Headroom universe, which they say Max is, <laughs> Max is coming back around. They've uh, Christopher Catwell yeah. is working on something for Max Headroom, and it's like, okay, yeah, the, the whole TV thing, I could, I could, I could, ex 
I can certainly navigate that world and exist in it, but there's nothing good or pleasant about that place. So <laughs> it's true. All right. So you've at this point, John, you have navigated the FSF podcast interview. <laughs> okay. However, we have one final question for you. We like to call it our silly question. Okay. It's what we like to end on. So we're going to plant you in the Star Wars universe. And if you could use the force to take care of one mundane task for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, well, now, see, that's, that, that's the thing, because what I'd like is I'd like the transporter so I never spend another moment in an airport. <laughs> <laughs> But Star Wars specifically forces you to go through airports. So it's true. Docking Bay 90, Docking I Bay mean, 94 or whatever it is. Luke didn't um, go I, through I, an airport to get to the one planet. No, he's had to go to the bar. That's, that's true. Oh. I, uh, I, I will say I have never seen anybody in Star Wars do their taxes. And so this being a, a February broadcast as we're doing this. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I have to suspect that somebody is using the force uh, to uh, to handle their accounting. Uh, these are not the receipts you're looking for. I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the receipts you're it, looking for. Yeah, it exactly. is. Yes, it is. It is. It is a much more fun uh, universe in that regard. Uh, they they don't get into that kind of stuff. There you go. I, I knew mine is the second I put this question down is that I was going to say folding laundry that I could sit there and just be like. No, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, that, 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 that would be good. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah if, if I could tell every telemarketer over the phone that this is not the number they're looking for, that would be, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> this is not the bank account you were looking for. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your works? Okay, uh, this is going to take a while. <laughs> the uh, uh, farawaypress.com is uh, is the website. Uh, I have behind the scenes notes on all of my uh, stories or most of my stories, uh, chapter by chapter trivia and and uh, you know sort of the director's commentary. Uh, on uh, on Twitter, it's JJM Faraway. Uh, it's also JJM Faraway on Post News. Uh, it is on. Um, Facebook, John Jackson Miller, Instagram, John Jackson Miller. Um, as we'd mentioned, the novel, a Star, Star, War, uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The High Country, that comes out uh, on the 21st uh, of, uh, of February. <laughs> but if you're listening to this on the 18th, it might be out now because sometimes these things sneak onto shelves before they actually are supposed to be there. They'll put them on the, uh, on the shelves when the, when the box is, is open. So uh, look around for it. I was uh, and, able to pre-order it on Audible, so. Well, every, well, everybody can pre-order it, and we encourage everybody to pre-order everything, but those Audible uh, things are not going to download until the 21st, whereas, you know, when a box shows up at the bookstore, sometimes, you know, if, if there's no sticker on it saying, do not put on sale yet, you know, it'll 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 be there. It ends um, up on a bookend, but, uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, um, and, and then um, I, I do have other releases coming up. Uh, Star Wars, I did a novel called Night Errant some years ago where I also did the graphic novels for it. Those <laughs> graphic novels for Night Errant are all coming out uh, back into print for the first time in nine years uh, in March uh, from Marvel. Uh, it's uh, the Star Wars uh, Legends Epic Collection Volume 5 for the Old Republic. And oh, so cool. when you have all five volumes, you have almost everything I did for Star Wars at Dark Horse. Uh, and nice. so that comes out then. And then people will be able to find me physically talking about this book uh, and 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 signing and selling it. Uh, I will be, I noticed the Detroit Lions uh, uh, hat there. I will be, uh, well, for, first of all, the, the, the book launch is uh, is uh, February 21st in Madison, Wisconsin at the Westtown Barnes & Noble, uh, 7 p.m. I'm doing a talk and a signing there. Uh, Detroit, I am in Detroit that weekend for... Um, Mm -hmm. the uh, Great Lakes Comic Con in Warren, Michigan. Uh, and then the week after that, I'm at uh, 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 Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle. Uh, and I'm doing oh, several, cool. panel, several panels there. And then two weeks out of that, after that, I'm at uh, Galaxy Con in Richmond, Virginia. And that takes us about a month and a half in advance. And I've got more stuff coming up, uh, more events, but those are the ones coming up. Very cool. Excellent. Well, we will make sure that our viewers and our listeners can 
figure out where to find you, see where they can meet you in person, where they can find your book, where they can just enjoy the stories that you've shared with us today as well. All right. Well, thank you all. And uh, yeah. may, the, may the force live long and prosper. Exactly. Yes. Something uh, like that. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to remind you guys that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to ensure that we get more amazing guests for you, like John Jackson Miller here today, to have these uh, conversations and funny moments for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It helps us far more than we can really describe. And check out uh, John's work at the links down below. And the and you guys are going to want to make sure that you guys check out this book. Like I said, I'm about 10 chapters in, and I'm very much enjoying it. I'm looking forward to the rest of it to see how this thing pans out. But if for whatever reason, you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department, the Gorn. Now I can neither confirm nor deny the appearance of the Gorn in John Jackson Miller's new book, Strange Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The High Ground. But I can tell you that ever since their reappearance in the Star Trek timeline, these creepy little lizard alien death machines are popping up everywhere and making life uncomfortable for everyone. Now, while you have every right to complain to our complaint department, after all, that's what it's there for, keep in mind that the Gorn aren't prone to caring who they eat, who was right, and who was wrong. Everybody looks like a meal. So although you may be right, and we are more than likely in the wrong, we could both be eaten. So no matter how many copies you complain of your complaint you send in, that's the struggle. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, thanks again, John. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Yeah. All right, guys, that's going to conclude us today for the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Bye. Ciao. Copyright 2023 FSF podcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF podcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels. <laughs>